Hello and welcome everyone. Today we will discuss the recently released ESICM guidelines on ARDS. Now ARDS was first described in 1967 and it was characterized as a new onset hypoxemia which was resistant to just supplemental oxygens with bilateral chest infiltrates and reduced respiratory system compliance. Eventually we developed definitions for this in 1988 and 1994 and finally the current definition that we are following is the Berlin definition of 2012. Now this is the guidelines which again reevaluate the definition and try to look into the future research that needs to be done. So the most important thing that we need to understand is the different phenotyping that needs to be done in ARDS. Now, phenotype is described as an observable trait resulting from interaction of genotype with the exposure. Here you can consider ARDS as a phenotype. Then you have subgroups. Subgroup is a subset of this phenotype which distinguishes itself by having a cutoff in a particular variable. For example, we have PF ratios. We have divided the patients into three types of PF ratios. So we have subgroups in the phenotype of ARDS. Then we have subphenotypes. This is a distinct subgroup that can be differentiated based on a pattern of measurable or observable property. Now endotype. Endotype is a subphenotype with a distinct functional and pathobiological mechanism which differentiates it from other subgroups. And it can be targeted differently by a specific therapy. For example, for COVID-19 ARDS, we have steroids and tocilizumab, these type of therapies which have specifically act and provide benefit in an endotype that is considered as COVID-19 ARDS. Now, the importance of accurate phenotype classification and the evidence of treatment effect, heterogeneity. Accurate subphenotyping directly influences your treatment strategies. Now, evidence from all these trials suggests that variable treatment responses among different ARDS subtypes. Accurate classification is critical for aligning treatment because ARDS is a heterogeneous group until and unless I know the exact subphenotype where a particular intervention is going to work, I am always going to get studies which are showing no benefit, no benefit and no benefit. So the subphenotype, the patient outcome and future research. Short term mortality varies among the subphenotype based on the systemic inflammatory response, the radiological findings, the recruitability, the clinical feature and the longitudinal changes in the respiratory parameters. Now the future research questions that we need to answer are the stability of these subphenotypes over time. Do they remain the same or patients jump from one subphenotype to another? The reproducibility of the subphenotype across a diverse population. The accuracy and the repeatability of the rapid subphenotype classification. The pathophysiological basis of this subphenotype development. Now, the, finally, the attributable mortality to each subphenotype. And the potential precision treatment strategy to be given for each subphenotype to improve the post ICU discharge outcomes. So, uh, now that we have done with the subphenotypes, we'll come into the treatment aspect of what we, the evidence we have for treating ARDS patient. The first is the use of HFNO versus conventional oxygen therapy in non mechanically ventilated patients. There have been seven RCTs with 2,769 patients which show that HFNO does not significantly reduce mortality over conventional therapy. The significant beneficial effect in reducing the need for intubation is definitely there. Now the recommendation is to use HFNO to reduce intubation risk. So if you have a patient who is requiring oxygen, you can try HFNO if you want to reduce the requirement of intubation. However, if you look at the beneficial effect, it is not very high and it is if your cost benefit is not fitting, you can go with the conventional oxygen therapy as well. The unresolved issues are the lack of long term functional follow up, the uncertainty around optimal HFNO duration and when to declare that the HFNO is failing. 
The next is HFNO versus NIV, a contentious topic with four RCTs, again showing no difference between the two groups. And in COVID-19, HFNO was associated with higher intubation rate. Here you can see the relative risk was 1.7 times that of NIV. Now for this particular subgroup, there is no recommendation against or for using any one of these therapies because there is no concrete evidence. You can use any one which you feel is correct. There are of course research gaps. We need more RCTs focusing on the mortality, the intubation rate and the mechanical ventilation duration. And most importantly, we must not forget the long term follow up that needs to be done in these patients. The next is NIV versus conventional oxygen therapy. Again, does not significantly reduce the intubations or the mortality rates compared to conventional oxygen. For COVID-19 patients, CPAP use is suggested to reduce the risk of intubation. However, again, insufficient data to make any sort of recommendations. Further research is needed to optimize. Next is what interface we can use for the NIV. There is a limited evidence which suggests that we can use helmet to reduce mortality and intubation rate. But again, no specific recommendations can be made based on the evidence that we have till now. No RCTs till now have compared NIV versus CPAP in terms of mortality and intubation. So no recommendations. And future research tells us to compare NIV versus just giving PEEP in treating acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. The use of low tidal volume ventilation and COVID-19 related ARDS and the normal ARDS. Now, seven RCTs, no significant reduction in mortality with low tidal volume compared to the traditional approaches, both in ARDS and COVID-19. Despite the lack of statistical significance, low tidal volume ventilation is recommended due to the strong physiological rationale and the ability to decrease billing. This extends to ARDS from COVID-19. Historically, uh, we have used previously very large tidal volumes, but then we have reduced since the ArtsNet trial and the understanding of the physiological concept and the current practice using lung protective ventilation with small tidal volume is something which is recommended right now. The future research tells us to find out more lung protection strategies, personalize our ventilator targets and also to look for long term goals. The understanding is to find out how to determine the optimal tidal volume and assess the potential of worsening willy in these patients. The next is PEEP titration. Should we use the higher PEEP FIO2 strategy? Well, the higher PEEP versus lower PEEP, no significant reduction in mortality. We have these three trials. We know them very well. There is no clear consensus on the ventilator free days and the incidence of barotrauma or hemodynamic instability. No definitive guidance for or against using any one of these strategies, even if you include COVID-19 patients. Now, PEEP titration based on respiratory mechanics. Again, respiratory mechanics based versus standardized table based. No significant evidence to suggest any one of them is better. Data from all these trials have been evaluated. No definitive guidance can be given because no clear evidence of any one of them being better than the worst. The next is the use of high pressure recruitment maneuvers and mortality. Theoretical benefit is recruitment maneuvers are supposed to promote the re aeration of the gasless regions of the lungs, improving gas exchange and thereby reducing the lung stress. However, they may risk complications like barotrauma, reduced venous return, and hemodynamic collapse. The evidence from the clinical trial is mixed, showing no effect on mortality, and one of them even showing potential harm. Now, the recommendations are against using a prolonged high pressure recruitment maneuver in ARDS, including the patients of COVID 19 ARDS. Now, how about using this high pressure recruitment for a brief period of time? Now, the brief definition is you use an air pressure of more than 35 centimeters of water for less than one minute. You don't keep it high for too long. Does it help? The analysis of the trials does not show a significant difference in the mortality, ventilator free days, barotrauma. However, there is limited evidence even on hemodynamic instability. The recommendation is routine use is not suggested, but it can be used 
if the person or the treating physician feels that it is going to benefit the patient because we have not seen clear harm as well. Although not suggested for routine use, brief recommendation is there for our limited role in reversing hypoxemia in certain situations. But you need to keep in mind the transient hypotension and bradycardia which can possibly develop. So if you are giving this maneuver, look out for the hemodynamics. Obviously, we need further research into the brief recruitment maneuver or the psi, which is being term used in our future research. The next is PEEP and recruitment maneuver. The current evidence does not conclusively support any of these mechanisms. Now, both prolonged and brief recruitment maneuvers have potential of risk and lack clear beneficial effect. Now, future research should focus on the potential benefits the risks, the individualized PEEP titration in clinical practice and the effect of different PEEP and recruitment strategies. And we must also keep into mind the positioning of the patient. Whenever the position of the patient changes, the requirement of the PEEP and recruitment maneuver can also change. So it's not that I have to keep it fixed despite of the patient's position being changed. The next is the importance of individualized care. Despite inconclusive evidences, individualized PEEP titration is critical in ARDS management. Excessive PEEP concept remains undefined as does the optimal PEEP levels, preventing decreased recruitment and avoiding hyperinflation. Careful evaluation of each patient's clinical scenario is vital for optimizing outcomes. Now the recruitment maneuvers, the potential complications. High pressure recruitment maneuvers can lead to over distension causing barotrauma and other complications. Reduced venous return, increased pulmonary vascular resistance, right ventricular failure, hemodynamic prolapse, all can occur. So it is critical to weigh the potential of the benefits against the risks that can develop and only then go for a recruitment maneuver. Now, what is the impact the COVID-19 has had on the ARDS management? Given the pandemic, the role of PREP and recruitment in managing COVID-19 associated ARDS is of paramount importance. Both strategies have a potential implication for patient outcome in this context. The current recommendations also apply to ARDS from COVID-19 and more focused research is required for specific patient groups. So whatever you are learning till now is mostly the research is coming from COVID-19. So we are extrapolating it to the ARDS. So we can't say for sure that it, this is going to work in all subphenotypes of ARDS. Again, the considerations for future research is to explore the brief recruitment maneuver because this is something which can reverse the hypoxemia in a brief period time. More studies are required to find out optimal PEEP and the balance between de-recruitment and over hyperventilation. And in these studies, we need to target short-term goals and not mortality as a target because we can't just give a brief recruitment maneuver and expect that is going to save the patient's life. Now, new evidence is crucial to better inform and shape guidelines and the treatment strategies for ARDS patients. The next and the most important and the one thing which has been conclusively seen as positive is prone positioning. Prone positioning is recommended for moderate to severe ARDS because it reduces mortality and it is supported by the PROCEVA trial. The concept was introduced in the 70s with multiple trials showing significant reduction in short term and 90 days mortality. The PROCEVA showed significant lower short term mortality in these patients and it is favored over supine position in moderate to severe ARDS. Now coming to the timing of the proning. Proning should be initiated early after intubation, post a period of stabilization with low tidal volume and PEEP adjustment. This is very important. You give a period of stabilization with low tidal volume and PEEP adjustment. Only after that, if the things aren't improving, then you prone. Proceva supports early proning after intubation. Prioritizing, optimizing the ventilator settings and stabilizing the hemodynamics before proning is of paramount importance. Now, the recommendation is to give prolonged sessions that is at least 16 hours plus you can give as per your practice if the PF ratio is less than 150 post stabilization. Now, what is the role of awake prone positioning? In non-intubated patients, we can try awake proning 
to help improve the oxygenation but the evidence is very low quality and uh, the trials which have shown the benefit of APP significantly reduce the risk of intubation in COVID-19 related failures. Now in terms of mortality they did not find any benefit. The recommendation is on close monitoring it is important to use it to delay intubation or to avoid intubation. However, we must have clear cut criteria to understand when it is failing and when I should go for intubation. We should not delay the intubation just because we are giving away prone positioning. Last is the contentious issue of neuromuscular blocking agents. The routine use does not necessarily reduce mortality with COVID-19 ARDS. This is the information that we have got because of the recent ROSE trial. NMBA administration reduces the work of breathing and patient ventilator asynchrony but prolonged use can lead to neuromuscular weakness and deep sedation. Now the initial trial that the accuracy trial showed benefit of early 48 hour infusion of this drug and it showed benefit in terms of mortality as well. Similar benefits were seen in other three smaller trials. Next came the ROSE trial. It found no significant dis in the mortality in patients after giving 48 hours infusion. Now this became the point of problem because it showed a clear difference in terms of result and the meta-analysis also did not show any significant finding. However, the variation in the pros and ventilation usage, the sedation targets, the PEEP strategies between the trials are significantly different. So we cannot just equate the two trials even the patient recruited into the rose trials are contentious because they did not use the classical pf ratio criteria to include the patients now what are the recommendations the recommendation is against using a routine nmba because of the rose trial however considering the other benefits that have been seen in the accuracy we need to understand there are other factors which are affecting the mortality that is the sedation levels the prone positioning and the peep strategies so it can be used in selective group of patients however the use of neuromuscular blocking agents has been found to be protective in reducing the incidences of pneumothoraces so there are a lot of unresolved questions and research gaps so we need to focus on outcomes like successful extubation, reintubation, paralysis recall, ICU acquired weakness, quality of life and all these things. Not just mortality as the ROSE study. So don't just see the ROSE study as a basis for not using NMBA. NMBA can be used but you have to keep in mind all the limitations that were there with the ROSE trial and the differences in the sedation and the ventilatory strategies between the two trials. Without going to the in-depth of these two points, we should not stop the use of NMBA just because it doesn't reduce mortality according to the ROSE trial. Lastly, we come to the VV ECMO. VV ECMO improves outcome and helps in replacing the gas exchange from the lungs. There are two trials which show significant decrease in the mortality and ECMO can cause serious bleeding so that is something which needs to be kept in the mind no randomized trials were done during the COVID-19 pandemic but observational studies show a protective effect of ECMO on short-term survival now the recommendations are use ECMO for severe ARDS based on the EOLA uh, eligibility criteria this recommendation applies to severe ARDS due to COVID-19 but lower evidence level due to indirectness of the available evidence. Now coming to the ECOR that is removing only the carbon dioxide in ARDS and COVID-19. Actually till now no such benefits have been seen. Now there have been two RCTs which did not reduce the mortality but were associated with pure ventilator free days. So ECOR was associated with increase serious side effects like bleeding risks. Now the recommendation is against this but it can be tried in patients who are having very high pressures to reduce the incidence of bleeding if my risk of bleeding are less. So keeping my risk and benefit it's some, it is something which can be tried in patients who are having very high pressures and in whom we are unable to remove the carbon dioxide. Thank you for your patience and hope the video was helpful. If you liked our video then like, share and subscribe to our channel. Thank you.